Good morning. Good morning. Let's just worship the Lord together this morning. I choose to worship, I choose to bow, though there's pain in the offering, I lay it down, here in the conflict, when doubt surrounds, though my soul is unraveling, I choose you now, I have a seat for just a minute. You ever have one of those days where you just wake up and you're like singing in the shower, just like overflowing with music? I'm sure some of you, you you don't have that moment as often as others, but there's just a, there are times in life where you feel like jumping up and down, you feel like singing a song, you feel like there's just so much uh, excitement inside that you can't contain it all. 
Um, it happens a lot at our house with all the, when you're younger, I think it happens easier, but it, it's just a, it's a fun and exciting thing. And this morning I want to see if I can help you find that for just a minute. This is out of first Peter. It says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that's un- imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it may be tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him, and though you do not know, or no, though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that he, that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Is there any greater thing to know that God has that inheritance for you, for those of us that are part of His family, that we have just waiting for us, all of that? And I don't. If there is anything that that just want to make makes your soul just want to sing. This next song has the words in it, how can hearts not love your name and how can souls not sing your praise? Let's just pull together what we know of God and who he is and what he's done for us and see if what comes up inside of us is just a joy we can't contain. Just join me in that this morning. Let's lift him up. I'm making money 
For those of you who may not have gone to our worship class several weeks ago or months ago at this point, the whole idea of to worship is to submit, to bend your knee, like you're coming before a king and you say, I'm part of this country. This is where I am. This is what I live for. So this morning as we just worship the Lord, pray, take your heart, lay it down. Just anything you have, all that you are, kneel it before your God, your maker, the Lord Jesus Christ.
of sin and darkness Whose love is mighty and so much stronger The King of glory, the King above all kings Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder And leaves us breathless in awe and wonder The King of glory, the King above all kings Won't you pray with me? Lord, we just thank you that you are such a great God, that you've set aside eternity, that you've made it something that we can be part of, that you've put in our hearts the ability to know you. Lord, we pray that we can walk close to you, that we would be able to see the best of life, that we would live the abundant life through you. Lord, I pray that you would help us today, that you would open our hearts, help us to understand your truth, that we could walk closer to you, that we could be overflowing with who you are and the joy that you give. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity we have to be your children, to be part of this family, to be able to stand next to our brothers and sisters in Christ and just proclaim your greatness to this world. In Jesus' name, amen. And as they are heading to the back, you can grab a Bible or your phone and open with me to the book of Ecclesiastes. 
Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, okay? It's not one that we look at a lot, although we are this summer. Ecclesiastes chapter 6 today. Ecclesiastes chapter 6. Isn't that amazing grace that we have? Unfailing love. Man, what a, what a great song and just great truths as well. You got it? Ecclesiastes 6? I've asked Caleb to do something for me today. I've asked him to play the very first week of our series on Ecclesiastes. Seth referred to a song. So I asked Caleb to play that, an intro to that song, and see if you can identify what the song is. And Matt's going to help him out here, okay? Have you heard that before? What's the song? You got it. That's right. You, you win the prize. I don't know what the prize is, but you win. I can't get no... Thank you, Caleb, and thank you, Matt. I can't get no satisfaction by Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones. That little riff that you heard, that's what it's called there, uh, a riff, Three notes, only three notes, but perhaps the most familiar three notes in all of rock and roll history. It's very familiar, very popular. In fact, that song that came out in 1965 is actually credited with kind of launching the whole rock and roll era. The lyrics are very simple. I can't get no satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction because I try and I try, and I try, and I try, but I just can't get no. I just can't get no satisfaction. I didn't sing it for you, did I? I spared you that at least, okay? And then, and then the verses are interesting. I'm not quite sure I understand exactly what they are, but this is what I think they mean. They're, they're about some advertising. First one's about an advertiser on the radio. The second one's about an advertiser on, on TV. And they're promising some kind of satisfaction through some great product, like all advertising does, right? You know, just drink this drink or, or use this shampoo or, or buy this car, or get this time-saving uh, uh, gadget, and your life will never be the same again. That's how you find it will satisfy your every longing, right? I can't get no satisfaction. But I try and I try and I try and I try. Well, that's actually the theme of Ecclesiastes chapter 6. The exact theme of this chapter, Ecclesiastes chapter 6. Solomon tries and he tries and he tries, but he can't get no satisfaction in life. Life under the sun. Solomon says that life under the sun is meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Now, I think in order for us to understand chapter 6, which is kind of the close of the first half of the book of Ecclesiastes, kind of brings it to an end there. In order to understand this, we kind of need to review real quickly the first five chapters, okay? In chapters 1 through 4, Solomon, we saw that he tried several paths in life in his search for meaning, for fulfillment in life. He tried the path of wealth, he tried wisdom, he tried work, he tried pleasure, and he tried power. And they all led to dead ends. They brought no satisfaction or fulfillment in life. In chapter 5, Solomon kind of narrows it down to two primary pursuits that people pursue in life. God or prosperity, God or wealth. And he concludes then in verses 18 through 20 of chapter 5 that the only path to fulfillment really is to pursue God and then when you pursue God, you can actually enjoy his gifts, his blessings in life. And so now we come to chapter 6. And in chapter 6, Solomon begins by identifying three of God's blessings in life. And then shares that he's kind of disillusioned that people are not finding satisfaction or enjoyment in these gifts, in these blessings. 
So then in verses 7 through 9, he says, and so since we can't find satisfaction in these blessings from God, man just tries and tries and tries on his own, but to no avail. And so he concludes the chapter then with a couple of questions that he wants us to think about and to ponder as we seek satisfaction and meaning in life. So let's start with the three gifts from God that should bring satisfaction, but don't seem to do so. Verses 1 through 6. I've seen another evil under the sun, and it weighs heavily on men. God gives man wealth, possessions, and honor so that he lacks nothing his heart desires. But God does not enable him to enjoy them, and a stranger enjoys them instead. This is meaningless, a grievous evil. A man may have a hundred children and live many years. Yet no matter how long he lives, if he cannot enjoy his prosperity, does not receive proper burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. It comes without meaning. It departs in darkness, and in darkness its name is shrouded. Though it never saw the sun or knew anything, it has more rest than does that man. Even if he lives a thousand years twice over but fails to enjoy his prosperity, do not all go to the same place. So in this first section, Solomon identifies three what we would call measuring sticks of God's blessing according to Hebrew culture, Hebrew understanding. Prosperity, posterity, and longevity. They come right out of the end of chapter 5, right after the end of chapter 5, when Solomon is talking about enjoying God's gifts in life. And so these are considered to be God's gifts, God's blessings, wealth, large family, and a long life. They're considered to be an, an, an indication, if you have these, that, that God is blessing you. And so he says in verse 1 then, so I've seen another evil under the sun. The word evil that Solomon speaks of there is simply a reference to, to the misfortune of not being able to enjoy God's gifts, God's blessings. In other words, God's blessings do not even guarantee contentment and fulfillment in life. As wonderful as these gifts are, and they are wonderful, Unless God is pursued first, unless God is in the center of them, they will not lead to satisfaction. You cannot truly enjoy them. So let's talk about these three gifts for a bit. Three blessings from God. The first one I've called a, a prosperous portfolio. God gives him first one. God gives a man uh, wealth, possessions, and honor so that he lacks nothing his heart desires, but God does not enable him to enjoy them, and a stranger enjoys them instead. This is a meaningless Grievous evil. In verse 19, Solomon uh, writes that God is the one who gives just that, riches and wealth and honor. So whatever we have is truly from God. However much riches and wealth and honor we have, it's a gift from God. But he bemoans the fact here that someone else is enjoying his wealth rather than the one who earned it or made the wealth. So whoever this wealthy person is, we don't know who the, who's really enjoying it, but whoever this wealthy person is, he's not the one enjoying it. Solomon also doesn't tell us why he's not enjoying his wealth. I don't know, maybe he's a workaholic. So focused on making wealth that he never takes time to stop and enjoy life, enjoy what he's made. Or maybe he's just too stressed out and worried about his wealth, afraid he might lose some or the stock market might crash or whatever. And so he can't enjoy it. He's just worried all the time about it. We've talked about this quite a bit because it's kind of a recurring theme in the book of Ecclesiastes. George Bernard Shaw, I think, summed, up, summed it up well. He said, there are two tragedies in life. One is not to get your heart's desire. The other is to get it. Think about it. You see, prosperity may actually be the greatest test of, may be a greater test of character than poverty. A Romanian um, church leader who spent some time in the West said this. He said, 95% of believers who face the test of persecution pass it. 95% who face the test of prosperity fail it. Think about it. Some of the wealthiest people in the world are also the most miserable. Classic example would be Howard Hughes. Last week, we talked about John D. Rockefeller as well. He basically said the same thing. 
Well, that's exactly what happens when God is left out of the equation. God has blessed us with this wealth, these riches, whatever it is. And if God's not the center, then we're not able to truly enjoy them. And so the point here is that a prosperous portfolio doesn't necessarily equate to satisfaction without God in the center. The second blessing that Solomon mentions is a large family. He says in verses 3 through 5, A man may have a hundred children and live many years, then no matter how long he lives, if he cannot enjoy his prosperity, does not receive proper burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. Now, large families were considered also to be a blessing, a sign of God's blessing. In fact, in Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5, we read, Sons are a heritage from the Lord, children a reward from him. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. And so a full quiver of children is considered a blessing from God. Now, Solomon is writing poetically here, so he's probably using some hyperbole. I mean, think about it. Who has 100 kids, right? Come on. Well, it may not be so much out of the realm of possibility in the Old Testament. In uh, Judges chapter 8, we read that Gideon had 70 sons, for he had many wives. That's what it says. And that's not even counting his daughter, so we don't know. How many kids did he have? Uh, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, the king that came after Solomon, had 88 children, 28 sons and 60 daughters from his 18 wives and 60 concubines. Now Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Now only three of his children are actually named in Scripture, Rehoboam and two of his daughters who married regional officers, officials. But with 700 wives and 300 concubines, you think 100 kids might be possible? Yeah, very possible. But anyway... In today's culture, large families are, are pretty rare, aren't they? Some, mostly, mostly because in our culture today, both parents are working. And so many times, as both parents work, kids are almost viewed as, a, as an inconvenience. That's not really the biblical perspective on family, okay? Not at all. The Bible says children are a blessing from God. And they truly are a blessing from God. When my wife and I start counting our blessings, we always start with 14. There's always 14 blessings we can enumerate right away. Three kids, their three spouses, that's one each, not three each, okay? Their three spouses and eight grandchildren. Add that up, that's 14 blessings. And they are truly a blessing from the Lord. Many of you have kids and grandchildren, some even more than us. You've even blessed even more than we are. Whatever kids and grandkids you have, they are truly a blessing from the Lord. But again, Solomon bemoans the person here who is blessed with children, who is blessed with a family, and doesn't seem to enjoy them. Ironically, in verses 4 through 5, he says that a stillborn child is better off than the man who doesn't find satisfaction in God's blessing, especially in his family. Now, the stillborn knows nothing of the frustrations and disappointments of life under the sun. So that's why he says he's better off. Or he has more rest than the one who doesn't enjoy God's blessing. Now, a stillborn never experiences life under the sun. Remains completely anonymous. Passes into obscurity. Nobody ever knows who or she that stillborn is. But still, that child will experience the grace of God and abide at rest with him in heaven. But Solomon basically says in this passage, in this verse, even being blessed with family, with kids, does not guarantee satisfaction in life apart from God. There's a third blessing, longevity, a long life. In verse 6, even if he lives a thousand years twice over but fails to enjoy his prosperity, do not all go to the same place? Now, obviously, he's using hyperbole here, right? This is obviously an exaggeration. 2,000 years basically doubles the life of the oldest man who ever lived, Methuselah, who lived 969 years. But according to the Ten Commandments, a long life is a blessing from God to those who honor their parents. And so Jewish people considered longevity 
to in fact be a blessing of God. Now, I just turned 67. But I have a long way to go to catch up with Art and with Doris, who are both around 96 years of age. That's longevity. God has blessed them with long life. That's great. But once again, Solomon bemoans individuals who are blessed with longevity and yet never seem to be able to enjoy their life, the life that God has given them. Yes, it's true. Life is filled with trials and frustrations and hardships. And those hardships can either direct us, can either drive us away from God or they can drive us to God, one or the other. And if they drive us away from God, then we just kind of end up in becoming a bitter, angry, grumpy old codger of some kind, you know. Enjoy life. But the way you enjoy life is not just through longevity, but when God is at the center of your life, then you can enjoy life. So you put all these three things together. What Solomon says in this first part of this chapter is that God's gifts will not satisfy apart from God himself. Even God's blessings won't satisfy us if God is not the center of our lives. A prosperous portfolio, a large family, a long life. Think about it. That should bring plenty of satisfaction, shouldn't it? But without God in the center of life, even his blessings do not satisfy the restless soul. So, if we're not satisfied, what do we do? We double our own efforts to find joy. We try and we try and we try and we try to find joy and satisfaction in life. And so that leads Solomon to suggest three, to mention three futile attempts that we attempt in our own human efforts to find satisfaction in verses seven through nine. All man's efforts are for his mouth, and his appetite is never satisfied. What advantage has a wise man over a fool? What does a poor man gain by knowing how to conduct himself before others? Better what the eye sees than the roving of the appetite. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. So three futile attempts to find satisfaction. Work harder, grow smarter, dream larger. First one, work harder. Verse seven, all man's efforts are for his mouth, yet his appetite is never satisfied. Think about the appetite, okay? Whether you're a CEO of Fortune 500 company, or, or a struggling college student working in a fast food restaurant, the bottom line is you work to satisfy your appetite. You work to eat, right? So whether you prefer to dine at Ruth's Chris Steakhouse, or you're content with a burger from Red Robin or Wendy's or wherever, you know what the truth is? The next day, no matter how much money you spent the day before, you're still going to be hungry again. And so your appetites are never fully satisfied, are they? The most desired meal that every kid in America wants is what? It's a happy meal. Every kid. Lincoln, when we're out in the car, he asks, can we stop for a happy meal? Can we get a happy meal? He's only three. He understands happy meals. McDonald's marketing agent struck gold when they introduced happy meals. Because they're not just selling a burger or McNuggets and fries and a drink and a cheap little toy. They're selling happiness. Can you buy happiness? A happy meal. The problem is that once the food is gone and the cheap plastic toy is broken, well, so is your happiness. It flies away too. But I think as much as we talk about our that kind of appetite. I think Solomon has much more in mind here than food. In fact, the word appetite in the Hebrew is actually the Hebrew word for the Hebrew word nefesh, which is the word for soul. And so he's talking about our soul's desires, our heart's desires, our lifestyle appetites. And when we're not satisfied with what God gives us, what do we do? We just work more ourselves, we work harder. We work overtime to make more money, to buy more stuff, to satisfy our appetites. Or we work harder to climb the corporate ladder, to satisfy our appetite for position and prestige. Or we work harder to build successful business in, the, in life. 
problem is that working harder doesn't necessarily lead to satisfaction, does it? Might lead to burnout. But it doesn't, but rarely does it lead to fulfillment and satisfaction. Why? Because we're relying on our own human efforts rather than trusting God. Rather than trusting God Himself. So that's one effort that ends up being futile, working hard. The second effort is to grow smarter. Verse 8. What advantage does a wise man have over a fool? What does a poor man gain by knowing how to conduct himself before others? Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived. People literally came from all over the world, and they didn't even have airplanes or cars back then, but still, they traveled from all over the world to Jerusalem to sit at the feet of Solomon just to listen to his wisdom, to get some pearls of wisdom from him. He was smart. Wise. But again, he asks, what advantage does a wise man have over the fool? Both face the same ultimate destination. Both eventually die. Well, still, people try to get smarter in order to find satisfaction. A lot of people today turn to education for fulfillment in life. You know, if I can just grow a little smarter, I'll figure life out. And I'll be satisfied. Or if I can get a college degree, then I can get the job I've always wanted. Or if I can get a master's degree or a doctorate, then I'll get a promotion. I'll get better pay. I'll get a, a better job. And so education is then held up as the pathway to happiness and satisfaction. The truth is that education doesn't equate, again, to satisfaction. There's no guarantee of that dream job, is there? Or the next promotion. In fact, the only guarantee is greater school debt. You just owe more money the more you go to school. Grow smarter doesn't work either. And so the third one is to dream larger dreams. Dream larger. Better what the eye sees than the roving of the appetite. This proverb in Solomon's version is basically Solomon's version of a proverb we often say today. And that is, a bird in the hand is better than two in the bush. In other words, what we can see with our eyes is better than what we think about or dream of, okay? It's better to have a little and enjoy what we have than to dream about more and more and more and never be able to attain it. So enjoy what we have. So the question then comes, is Solomon telling us that it's wrong here to dream great dreams or or to have great ambitions? No, that's not really what he's saying. But our dreams and our ambitions must always be guided by God. They must be God-centered. They must be God-focused. So basically, we must learn to be content with what God has given us, what we can see with our eyes, rather than simply spending our lives chasing selfish dreams. Put all that together, those three futile attempts, what Solomon is saying here is that all of our human efforts on their own fail to satisfy All of our human efforts fail to satisfy. So the Rolling Stones were right. When I can't get no satisfaction, I try and I try and I try and I try. I work harder. I I grow smarter. I, I, I dream larger. The problem is that trying and trying is all about human effort apart from God. And it will not lead to satisfaction. All our human efforts fail to satisfy. And so Solomon wraps up the chapter with a couple of questions. Actually, a reminder and a question, but I'm going to pose them as two questions, okay? Verses 10 through 12. Whoever exists has already been named, and what man is has been known. No man can can contend with one who is stronger than he. The more the words, the less the meaning, and how does that profit anyone? For who knows what is good for a man in life? During the few and meaningless days, he passes through like a shadow. Who can tell him what will happen under the sun after he is gone? The first one is really a reminder, but I'm going to pose it as a question. Who's in charge? Who's really in charge? What it is, it's a reminder of God's sovereignty. God is in control. God is in charge. I pose it as a question because the truth is that we often want to be in control, don't we? We have, a, we have a really hard time when we're not in control of things, don't we? We sure do. 
And so who's in charge? Let me just walk you through the verse here. It says, whatever exists has already been named. In other words, God has named the stars. Adam named all the animals. God cared for the birds, the air, the flowers of the sea. It's all known to God. Everything is known to God. God knows your past. He knows your present. God even knows your future. Who's in charge? Then he says, what man is has been known. In other words, God doesn't just know your name. He knows all about you. He knows you inside and out. He knows your personality. He knows your likes and your dislikes. He, he knows your dreams and your ambitions. He knows your strengths and your weaknesses. He knows everything there is to know about you. He knows your soul. He knows what makes you tick. He knows what makes you, you. Who's in charge? And then he says, no man can contend with one who is stronger than he. Well, who's stronger than us? God. No man can contend with God. The more words, the less the meaning, and how does that profit anyone? In other words, we contend with God and we argue and fight with God because we want to be in control. Basically, God is stronger. God is wiser. So why fight with him? Why argue with him? Who's in charge? You or God? And then the second question he poses here for us is, what really matters in life? Verse 12. For who knows what is good for a man in life during the few and meaningless days he passes through like a shadow? You see, we think we know what's good for us, don't we? We really don't. But God does. And so a wise person who surrenders to this sovereign God will pursue God first and foremost because that's what's best for him. That's what's good for men. Life may seem fleeting and meaningless at times, but when we pursue God and we pursue God's will, well, life becomes meaningful and satisfying because God is first. God is in the center. Then he says, who can tell what will happen under the sun after he's gone? In other words, what difference will my life make on future generations? On people around me, my kids, my grandkids. When I pursue God and focus on relationship with God, then I find satisfaction in life. Or the future, you know, what will my kids and my grandchildren remember? What, what impact will my life have on them? What really matters in life? In this present life? Or in the future life? What really matters? When I pursue God, when I focus on relationship with God, only then will I find real satisfaction in life. Did you get it? So we got all these blessings from God that never seem to satisfy because we have this restless soul. And so we just work harder and harder and harder trying to find satisfaction, but we never can. We, we work harder, we, we grow smarter, we dream larger, but it doesn't bring satisfaction. So Solomon says, who's in charge? And what really matters in life? What really matters in life is pursuit of God. And when you pursue God, then you find satisfaction. And that brings us to the last verse. Ecclesiastes 12, Solomon's conclusion in the last chapter. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and you have this memorized now, don't you? Well, let's all say it together, okay? That's why we put it up here, because you may not have it quite memorized, but by the end of this series, in the summer, you'll have it memorized, okay? Let's say it together. Now, all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Now, usually that's the ending. Today, that's not the ending. I want to close with a, more of a personal note, okay? <clears throat> when I chose to preach on Ecclesiastes, I wasn't so sure about it. I mean, I had been thinking about and wanting to preach on Ecclesiastes for a very long time, but it just didn't seem to flow logically. I couldn't seem to put it all together in a nice, neat, little, tidy package, and it still doesn't fit in a nice, neat, tidy package. Maybe because it's poetry. And I never did 
good in literature, especially poetry. I just never liked poetry. It's just not my thing, okay? But this is different poetry, and and I kind of get Hebrew poetry a little bit. However, I think I figured out why God led me to preach the book of Ecclesiastes. I think this series is as much for me as it is for you. Ecclesiastes 6, to be perfectly honest, describes me to a T. You can even ask my wife, and she would probably tell you, yes, it does. Let me explain. We have been very blessed by God, very blessed. Oh, no. You know, when we talk about wealth, that's one of the blessings. I wouldn't say that we're wealthy by America's standards of wealth. Certainly not. But God has given us plenty, and and God always provides all of our needs for all of our needs. Always. So we've been blessed tremendously. We have been super blessed with family. Not 100 children, but 14 great blessings. Three kids, three spouses, eight grandchildren. Eight grandchildren. And I've lived a relatively long life and good life, 67 years and counting. So we've been blessed. The truth is I've always had a bit of a restless soul. Contentment is not really my forte. We wouldn't say that's my soul. Never seemed to be satisfied. Always looking for more. Not more stuff. I don't need more stuff. Do you need more stuff? We don't need more stuff. But more of something. In fact, sometimes I can't even identify what that more is. Just more of something. And so what do I do? Whenever I become restless, whenever I get dissatisfied myself, well, my human efforts kick into overtime. Very much so. And I, first thing I do is I work harder. If things aren't going the way that I think they should be going, I just work harder. And the truth is, I work a lot. So if I work harder, that means I teach more, I study more, I plan more, I prepare more, I fix more, I design more, I just do more and more, I visit more. Whatever it is, I, I just do more of it. Does it help? No. Not really. And so then I just, so I've always tried to learn more, to grow smarter. I used to attend a lot of church growth conferences and leadership conferences until I went to a church growth conference and I kind of thought to myself, I've heard all this, I could be teaching this, so I quit going. Instead, I went back to school and I got a doctor's degree. And now let me ask you, what do you think a doctor's degree has accomplished for me? got a much higher salary. No. Doctor's degree didn't really accomplish much of anything for me, except some extra learning, which is fun. And I continued to read books, more books on church ministry and on leadership. In fact, I'm reading one right now, even as we speak. Well, not as we speak, but right now I'm in the middle of a book on church ministry. And I certainly dream larger. I've always been a dreamer. In fact, when I was really young, I used to dream that I could be the next Chuck Swindoll. That was my dream. Well, I'm not, and that's okay. It really is okay. I don't even know that I'd want to be. But in my last two churches, uh, we built newer, larger buildings. One church we even relocated, which we desperately needed to do in both churches, But I was the one who was leading in the dreaming, in the planning, in the designing. I was a dreamer. And I continue to dream big. And so I even find myself fighting with God a lot. Arguing with him. Contending with God. The one who's greater than me. Why? Because things aren't going the way I think they should be going because I'm a bit restless, not satisfied. So as all this working harder and growing smarter and dreaming larger satisfied my restless soul? No, not at all. 
And so I am the one who needed the series on Ecclesiastes. Just to remind me that satisfaction and fulfillment in life is not found through pursuit, human pursuit, but only through pursuit of God. Never through fleshly pursuits. Even if those pursuits are ministry related and good pursuits, still if God is not the center, they don't lead to satisfaction. So I needed this series. Have I arrived? Not at all. But I'm in process. And I'm still growing. And I hope you'll be patient with me. I'm 67. I should have figured life out already, right? We're still growing. And as I pursue God, I know that satisfaction will follow. So Ecclesiastes really has been for me. I hope and pray that you get something out of it too. Maybe you're wrestling with some of the same issues that I do, finding purpose and commitment and, or, or uh, contentment and satisfaction in life. I can tell you from the book of Ecclesiastes and from personal experience that doubling down on human efforts doesn't work. It won't get you there. It'll get you tired and burned out, but it won't find satisfaction. Life is all about the pursuit of God. Life is about relationship with God. He is the only one who can transform a restless soul into a soul at rest. Did you get that? God is the only one who can truly transform a restless soul like mine into a soul at rest. So when the Rolling Stones saying, I can't find no satisfaction, I want you to think about something, okay? They didn't know English very good. I can't find no satisfaction. Can't find no. That means there's two, a dub, double negative. What's a double negative make? A positive. In other words, you can find satisfaction. You and I really can find satisfaction in life, but it only comes through pursuit of God. Let's pursue him together, okay? Let's do that. Let's make that our purpose, our goal, our aim, our pursuit in life relationship with God. Let's pray. Thanks, Lord, for your word. Thank you for just using this series in my life. And I pray, Lord, that others get something out of it too. Lord, I just pray that you would truly be our pursuit in life. May you be the center of our life. May relationship with you be first and foremost in all that we say and all that we do, Lord. Thank you for your word. Lord, I just want to Pray for anybody here who is in the process of just trying to figure life out and find satisfaction. I just pray, Lord, that each one of them, my, my, each person here might also just come to realize that pursuit of God is really the only thing that matters. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Heaven's throne, you came to us and set your heart upon the cross. You'll never know the sacrifice you made for all our sins and all our shame. You took the nails and took our place. No one else.
and lift your name. We lift your name, Jesus. dismissed. Go with the Lord.